Welcome to the Public Sector Marketing Show, a podcast for government and public sector marketing professionals who want to level up their digital marketing and social media knowledge, skills, and strategic thinking. And now, welcome your host, Joanne Sweeney. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the Public Sector Marketing Show. Today is a very special episode. We bring you behind the scenes of the third annual Public Sector Digital Marketing Summit. So coming up in this episode, we bring you case studies and keynotes and panel discussions from day one. Public sector marketing pros from across the world share their lessons learned from a communications perspective from COVID-19. We also share with you some of the insights, the tactics and the strategies that you should be thinking about in 2022 for your social media and your digital marketing platforms. And I also give you my favorite bits from the summit. Obviously, we had to go online this year, but I can definitely tell you that the engagement and the value given to our attendees was definitely not compromised. So sit back and enjoy the special episode. A pandemic, a pivot online. What are the digital communications lessons from COVID-19? Today, we go behind the front line of digital marketing and social media in government and public sector. March 2020 changed all our lives and it changed how you did your job. The antidote to the virus pre-vaccine rollout was great digital communications. Leadership from the front line required our governments and public sector health officials to go front of screen. Live streams on social media, websites incorporating live chat, TikTok videos on how to wear a mask and wash your hands. What is two meters and why should we take the vaccine? In other areas of public life, communications professionals were at home with partners, children and pets. Many even were alone. But your work did not stop. You ramped up the conversations, adopted new ways of working and committed to digital like never before. For that, you have transformed how citizens engage with you forever. You no longer have what McKinsey described as a monopolistic mindset. Today is about commending the work of communications professionals across public health, policing, higher education, national and local government, agriculture, marine science, citizen rights, transport and indeed reflective of all state and semi-state agencies. Thank you for your commitment to great public interest communications. Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences so generously today. Before we start, let's take a look back at some of the pivotal moments over the past 18 months. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. They're fighting a war here and they are losing. The sheer numbers of people succumbing to the coronavirus is overwhelming every hospital in northern Italy. The staff are working flat out, trying to keep these people from deteriorating further. They're trying to stop them from dying. This isn't an intensive care unit, it's an emergency ward. The ICU is full. People have only just arrived here and they're in terrible shape. We've not win witnessed a pandemic of this nature in living memory, and this is uncharted territory for us. We said we would take the right actions at the right time, and we have to move now to have the greatest impact. So from 6 p.m. today, the following measures are being put in place, and they will stay in place until the 29th of March. The epidemiological situation has deteriorated substantially in recent weeks. The level of infection has increased rapidly and our 14-day incident rate is now 1,410 cases per 100,000 population. In addition, the OR number was estimated last week to be between 2.4 and 3 for the country. The incidence rates are very high across all age groups, especially young adults, and across every part of the country. 
while what's going on right now, Ken Corley, is really difficult for people, there is hope. In recent weeks, two vaccines have received regulatory approval from the European Medicines Agency, and a third will be decided on before the end of the month. Among those 50 to 59, almost 90% have registered, and almost 80% have started vaccination. Almost 100% of our citizens over the age of 70 are now fully vaccinated. This is unsurpassed in the European Union. I'd like to say, because we never ever get a chance to do this, is to really thank our media and social media teams. They're the silent heroes of our response uh, and have engaged and understand that we don't go after the messenger. What we try to do is make sure that we replace bad information with good information. And uh, that's as important in fighting a virus uh, as any frontline health worker. So chapeau to our teams who do the silent work. Moving to the World Health Organization and coming to us from headquarters is Alexandra Komanovic, who will deliver our first keynote of the day. Uh, Alexandra is social media manager at the WHO. She has served there since July 2018. She co-manages WHO's presence on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, TikTok and Snapchat, supporting WHO top leaders in social media activities and leading social media related partnerships, including those on fighting COVID-19 misinformation. She joined the organization in March 2015 and served as communications consultant in the Department of Public Health and Environment prior to her current social media position. So Alexandra, wonderful to have you here and the stage is yours. Mm, private sector, they are, they are monitoring their KPIs through social media KPIs as well, through a return of investment, product sell, profit made, etc. We don't have that type of KPIs, but for us, the KPI is trust built. And in our case, working in a global health is life saved because we, what we are providing people with through social media is life saving information. So um, make sure or find a way to show those, our KPIs uh, to your leadership so that they can understand the value of social media presence, both as a communications, but also as a listening tool. In our team, we are really relying 99% on social media to listen, what are people's concerns, what is actually a conversation around our organization, our leadership, but also to identify misinformation and to act ASAP to debunk those if need be. We're moving next on to our next speaker. And if COVID-19 resulted in a, a public health pandemic, COVID-19 also uncovered another pandemic or epidemic of sorts, and that one being domestic violence. And so we now have Dara Brennan, who's head of communications at the Department of Justice, and he's going to share with us him and his team's award-winning campaign called Still Here. And really what this leans into is where government and public sector really understanding where communications is key in those very sensitive matters. Dara is a very seasoned communications professional in government and previously held roles in Australia, New Zealand and Asia. He's a published broadsheet journalist and experienced people manager and has a long track record as a trusted advisor to C-suite executives and government ministers. And he combines his 15 years experience in government and PR with significant experience in leading transparency projects. And one interesting side note, is that Dara actually hired one of our speakers later today in another continent, but I'll, I'll let him explain that story. So um, if I may, I'll ask Dara to take to the virtual stage. We talked obviously extensively with our frontline partners like Safe Ireland and Women's Aid and Great Price Centres. And they're saying that while those calls had actually dropped off, um, the people who were calling were actually, um, they're, they're much more de desperate and that the, the intensity of those calls are becoming much more difficult. Um, so and actually this, this quote that here kind of, I think outlines it, we came directly from one of our frontline partners and saying basically, 
that while the phone lines were ominously quiet, victims were actually being confined with their abusers and they didn't know help was available. Um, and basically that we have to help and we have to let them know that help is still here. And that, that became the, the genesis, I suppose, of the creative concept behind that. Um, working with those with, with everybody across government and with those partners, we, we worked very closely to make sure that we were clearly defining what these challenges were. Um, and what they were, obviously, was victims thought that the COVID-19 restrictions meant that domestic violence supports were no longer available during lockdown. Um, domestic violence victims did not know where to find help. And victims said that the two kilometers rule made them feel that they were trapped and they thought they could not travel to escape their abuser. So we used that insight and we, we set very, very, very clear objectives, smart objectives, ones that obviously we want to be able to, um, to measure against. And obviously that was ensuring victims that domestic abuse knew where to access support services, ensure that an increase in the number of calls to helplines by at least 15% during the duration of the campaign. And uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a 75% recall and awareness of the Still Here campaign message. Um, so that's what kind of guided us uh, from, from a, a research part of it. The creative concept behind it, and I, I am going to play a video now in a moment, um, but kind of sitting down and, and planning how we were going to roll this thing out, it, it wasn't particularly easy. The audience insight, obviously, that was, you know, that came from both stakeholder groups and desk researchers that, Victims of domestic abuse can be traditionally very hard to reach and slow to seek support. Um, that was exasperated because at the time, victims were particularly isolated um, due to the public health restrictions that were in place. Um, and as the domestic violence, essentially domestic violence victims are found throughout society, irrespective of age, gender, socioeconomic background. So the traditional audience profiling was quite difficult as well. It was very difficult from a social media perspective, obviously, to set up avatars, et cetera, things like that. So the way we approached it was, and, um, and this was working directly with the NGOs in the area, was that we knew that we needed to reach a national audience, but that for it to be effective, we needed a local message from a trusted voices to provide reassurance that support remained available. Um, and that was the key insight behind this, making sure that we had that national message with the local voice and that reassuring piece. Um, and that, I suppose that that's where the, the campaign itself came from. So a lot to take in there. I think one of the, the themes right across the three presentations is the ability of small teams to create really great campaigns. Um, Alexandra, we have a question for you first, um, and let me put that to you. Uh, Ruth Rogers, who's actually going to be speaking up next, says, brilliant presentation so far. I'm really interested in Alexandra's comments about pandemic preparedness and the need to ensure the digital team as re is ready, and also how they link with their audio-visual team to produce content. She wants to know your thoughts on the core components or the key skills that are needed in very small digital teams? Um, thank you for the question. It's, it's a great one. I, could, I, I think I could talk about this uh, quite a lot. Um, first, in terms of connection with the AV team, at least for us, we are part of the same the department, of the same department. Uh, audiovisual team is small, but as we got some extra uh, people on the team during the pandemic, the audiovisual team as well, and we actually collaborated in hiring the person, one of the people to be more specialized in social media video creation, or at least someone who has a, a better understanding of social media video content rather than uh, full on professional video, video production. Um, so this is one concrete tip that uh, I could give. Um, in small teams, I think there's um, there's a mix of skills. One is definitely trust and teamwork, because you really need to work as one. And um, when we were two on the team, me and my colleague, we are constantly in touch. We are still in touch. We are trusting each other. If one gives one opinion or feedback to something, we fully trust on what we are actually sending to the rest of the, the, the organization. Also, we are very free to share ideas with each other. 
Uh, and also to, we are open to testing different ideas. As, as, as I mentioned, not everything has to be a perfect or a big campaign. A lot can be done within understanding the net platform, spending a lot of time on platform, benchmarking and looking into ideas and using existing features. So I think that's their trust uh, to, to test and, and to, to do to the best of your own abilities of creativity, um, I would say. Uh, speaking of preparedness, um, I think the number one is actually to raise, to use this opportunity of pandemic um, to raise awareness on the importance of social media presence, institutional social media presence, not only leaders. I, we are seeing a lot of leaders being present. Uh, also, in some, we don't. We, we have leaders who don't necessarily understand importance of institutional presence. So this is the first thing. I think we need that leadership commitment and understanding so that they invest resources into building social media presence. Uh, Quite often, probably that would be one person uh, in the team. But if you have a sustainable post and sustain person who really does that job, only that job, um, I, I would say that that is a good start. And I think then we need to use any network that we can to help each other in sharing the knowledge, organizing trainings, conferences like this, um, as not every organization has resources to invest in training their own stuff. So I think we need to rely on a collaborative efforts from, from us all. And um, I do have very health lenses in this as I've been working on health for now over six years. Um, exchanging knowledge with someone from different public sector can be useful, especially the pandemic has taught us that all these different issues are interconnected. So we can exchange ideas, creativities, um, and and support support each other more on a human resources level, not just on retweets and shares and 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 that that type of engagement. Thank you, Alexandra. And as always, very practical advice from Alexandra because you're you're on the ground on the front line. Next question is going to Dara and. All of you presented your analytics and your data insights um, demonstrating the success of the campaigns. But a, a question here, how do you measure citizen behavior change? And for you in particular, Dara, you were working with so many stakeholders in order to push out the Still Here campaign. And that inspiration for the campaign from one of the staff members, were then one of the domestic violence services said, you know, our phones are ominously quiet, but we're still here. After your campaign, was there a marked transformation in those phones ringing? and the message is getting out? The, the really good question. Um, it's something, not just behavior change, but it's just a measurement of communication in general um, is something that I'm <laughs> quite obsessed about, mainly because I don't, and I mentioned this within the, um, within the, the presentation itself is about, I think regardless of what you're doing with, from a comms perspective, it is about sitting down and making sure you're having very, very clear objectives as to what you want to actually achieve. Um, and, you know, it might be a little bit of a cliche, but it, 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 is, it is good practice. You need smart objectives, so you're clearly defining. You're, you're not saying just that we want the phones to ring, temp, you know, we want the phones to ring more, we want them to ring 20% more, 30% or 5%, whichever it is. The key to a lot of that in terms of that measurement, whether it's behavior change or whether it's, it's anything, is if you can, and, and I'm, I'm conscious, obviously, that across public sectors, well, there's sometimes isn't the budget to be able to actually, you know, to do, do the research beforehand. But, for example, if you're talking to stakeholders themselves, whether it's domestic violence or anything else, is identifying what that that behavior change is that you want. So you want people to stop um, throwing chewing gum on the ground or something and you're working with the local council and you work with them then to figure out, well, what's the metric by which you're actually going to, to measure that behavior change itself? Is it that there is less cleanup or whatever and, and what's the percentage, et cetera, to it? That, that's the hard part. That's the really, really difficult part of comms is kind of, zeroing in specifically on what that behavior change is trying don't get distracted by you know other things that you know might be kind of a little bit shinier but really really focusing in on what you want to achieve 
uh, benchmarking that at the beginning and then it's the research at the end that you want to be able to kind of point to what the change is and that I think that was one of the strengths of the still here side of things as well is that we spent an awful lot of time in well sorry a, a large proportion of the time that we had we didn't have a lot of time to put that campaign together I think we put it everything together and launched it in about a week and a half but a large part of it was that first kind of almost a week was getting it right before we launched and make sure we had a very clearly defined objectives that we could measure against so that we could at the end of it point to the fact that you know the, the phones were ringing more they were ringing significantly more um and you know that that was probably the most well it was absolutely the most um the best part of that campaign. Brilliant, thank you. And moving on then to Cathy and Sherry are in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Um, clearly, the messaging around uh, supports for businesses were very many because they kept being extended and changed. Um, how did you manage to sustain the level of intensity? for all of that messaging, a bit like public health, it just kept changing and changing. You know, was there, was there any kind of life hacks or professional hacks that you um, introduced to try and keep you guys going as, as comms professionals? Who wants to take that one? No, well, I'm just laughing at, at, at what sustained us. I think a, a good sense of humor. I mean, the irony of it is that Sherry R and I have never actually worked in the same office together so share you know she, i was on mat leave and sherry are joined well i was on mat leave and we you know we started to work together with with the rest of the team you know so it was it, it's building up the relationships between ourselves and um but i mean to the point of how did we how did how did we keep changing and sustaining going back to that point which i'm i've always been a big believer of you need to be in the room to hear the information firsthand and not have it parsed to you by somebody else because your take on what you're listening to is going to be different to what your policy colleagues take is so that's always a big a big piece for me and um, so it's making sure you're in the important meetings to be honest sherry or what what else kept us going well, we, uh, apart from being in the room it was just that it was crucial that we got all, uh, the information um, at the right time we disseminated it at the right time as well we were constantly updating and reviewing, as I mentioned, you know, our content, and that was liaising with our wider government colleagues, um, Department of Finance, Department of Social Protection, Revenue. We wanted to make sure all our content was updated, you know, to the minute, if you will. And we wanted to get businesses, anything that was updated, we got it up on social media, letting businesses know new updates to, you know, the Restart brand, um, financial supports are available. So that was the key part, was just keeping ourselves updated and liaising with government colleagues, you know, colleagues across government agencies and uh, um, offices as well. Level up your digital skills by taking our diploma in digital marketing, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code Digital Marketing Twenty for a twenty percent discount. Visit PublicSectorMarketingPros.com. Moving on to the important business uh, of this morning and that's session two at the summit and this is titled Meaningful Engagement in a Virtual World. So what I wanted to do was to invite public sector professionals who again working on the front line of comms over the past 18 months in various different agencies to share their experiences of how they were able to get meaningful engagement with citizens because as we know you can go on social media, you can publish articles on your website, you can launch podcasts and YouTube videos, and you will get reach, you will get impressions. But the real measure of success online is engagement and meaningful engagement. And our next set of speakers have actually achieved that. Um, and we are going to uh, Northern Ireland first, and we are going to Ruth Rogers, who's Head of Communications and Strategic Corporate Affairs of the Southern Health and Social Care Trust. And Ruth is going to share with us podcasting through a pandemic. And I've watched Ruth on this journey um, and I think it's a remarkable case study and she's going to share her experience. So Ruth, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Joanne. 
and to all the speakers this morning. It's been um, fascinating, really informative, and I, I've taken copious notes, as I'm, I'm sure all of you have, and a lot of inspiration from it. We very quickly realised that despite all of those channels that we had in place, there was a significant case for change needed, and we needed to step up and do something more. And as, as all of you know, I mean, many, we're all here today, probably zo you know, zooming in from whether it's our, our living rooms or attics or um, offices at home. Likewise, our staff who weren't frontline were dispersed everywhere. Um, and the frontline staff who were required to wear this new PPE, we really needed to get that information to them in a very timely way. And another difficulty that we faced was that this the guidance around the PPE and other matters relating to COVID was constantly changing. One day when you thought you knew where you were, the virus had evolved, the thing had changed again, and there was a need for new and additional guidance or information out. And equally, because of restrictions, there was no face-to-face -face training. So ordinarily, where we could have brought people together to share this information, well, that wasn't happening. So really, we just hadn't had a challenge on this scale before. And we very quickly needed to find out a way of communicating this very complex information and doing so quickly. Um, we're going to our next group of speakers. And we have the team from Citizens Information Board. We have Dara Woods, who's Digital Content Executive. We have Sabrina Cummins, Digital Content Executive, and also Bar Bobby Barber, Communications Manager. Now, this team's work involves them looking at the communications that is coming from every government department related to the pandemic. So you can imagine there was a lot, and they wanted to interpret that and make sure that factual information was being shared online. Suffice to say, their websites exploded, their social channels exploded. I've had Bobby previously on the podcast talking about this, but I felt it was really important to get the team in and to share with them how, what road they took to meaningful engagement with citizens during the pandemic. And Dara Woods, you're going to open the session and the virtual stage is yours. Thanks, Joanne. Um, good morning. So I'm Dara Woods, and together with my colleagues, Sabrina Cummins and Bobby Barber, we're going to talk to you about the journey that the Citizens Information Board um, has taken on social media over the last two years. How we've moved from we moved from minimal social media use in early 2020 to fully engaging with citizens on social only a few months later. And also how COVID gave us the push to go all in on social. I like to say that in early 2020, we were very slowly lacing up our boots and getting ready for a leisurely walk on a nice, easy social media journey. But then in 2020, we, in March, we were pretty much catapulted to the bottom of Everest without maybe all the gear or knowledge that we needed, and we just had to climb. So in this presentation, um, you'll find out if we made it or not. So let's get started. So who are the Citizens Information Board and what do we do? So CIB provides information, advice and advocacy on people's rights and entitlements in Ireland. We have a network of uh, citizens information centres around the country. We have a national phone line and we have the website citizensinformation.ie. Maybe some of you have come across us already or you've used our website. We actually had over 15 million users of the website in 2020. Myself and Serena work on the digital content team at Citizens Information. Um, we manage the Citizens Information social media accounts and we also write content for the website. The Citizens Information Board also provides information and advice on money and budgeting services through MABS, our money and advice and budgeting service. Um, we have um, the National Helpline, we also have, are available in 60 locations for MABS. Um, there's also a MABS website and chat on WhatsApp. Bobby, who will be speaking at the end of this presentation, is the Communication Manager for MABS in Awalia. So my colleague Sabrina is going to take over from here and explain how the citizens' information ramp, ramped up on social to respond to the public's information needs during COVID and the input, impact that that change, changed approach had. Then Bobby is going to cover how MABS actually responded and the input and the impact that that had for them as well. Thanks, Dara. Um, so as Dara just mentioned, we were lacing our boots 
and preparing for a slow and steady leisurely climb up the mountain. But that changed quickly in March 2020. All of a sudden, we were on the way to the summit without realizing also the social media summit. And I had to make decisions very quickly on how to respond to the need for up to date, accurate information on social media. So what did we do in Citizens Information to respond to this? One of the first things we did was set up a focused social media team. This was a first for us as social media was previously an add on to the website. The website was our focus. So now we were meeting daily. We set up a communication channel on Slack and we're in constant communication with each other to identify how we could address the needs of the public through social media. We increased our posts from one post a day to sometimes up to 25 or 26 posts per day. There were times during the especially the beginning of the pandemic, when the website was being updated hourly. So we had to ensure that information was getting out there and social was the way to do that. People were at home on their phones, so we had to get into them in their house. We also now had to respond to queries on social. This was also brand new for us. People were looking for real-time accurate answers and we had to answer publicly. The increase meant we had to simplify our process. So in the early days, we would have contacted a category owner who is like our in-house expert to draft a reply. But now we had to draft and verify within the social media team to get the response out in a timely way. So the benefits of this means we have streamlined our processes as I talk about further down in the, in the presentation. We harness the power of Facebook. So what this means is we quickly realized that people were looking for information from us on Facebook. We were getting comments, tags, queries, and we knew we had to engage with the audience where they, where, where they were. So Twitter also started to grow, but the bulk of our audience are using Facebook. So we tapped into all the tools and insights that Facebook has, and this resulted in huge growth, which I'll show again further down in the presentation. But we needed help with the queries also. So we worked together with SIPS. So that's our citizens information phone service. We're based in Cork. They have expertise in complex queries. So they took on the responsibility of drafting replies. We would then, as writers, edit the replies to make them more social media friendly. And this allowed us to spend more time working on posts and to research updates to make sure that we were meaningfully engaging with, with our audience. We developed our own tone of voice um, and focused on consistency. So speaking directly to the end user. So what this means is we used an active voice. We decided to engage with people in a conversational and empathetic tone to show we were real people behind the platforms. We made sure to use diverse images and use plain English for our posts. No jargon, uh, speak directly to the user. This is very important to make sure we were, we were engaging with the public. We also promoted local, uh, available local services. This, this again was new for us as services, citizen information services work all around Ireland in different regions. Um, and they promote themselves locally. Whereas now we could highlight which services were working from home, how to get in touch, um, what was available. And they now work directly with us, the social media team, to help them promote the services. And this, this uh, collaboration has been maintained um, even to the present day. I'll pass you over to Bobby now, who'll go through the, the steps that MAPS took. Thanks. So it's fair to say that COVID, uh, that the sorry, Citizens Information Service um, was one step ahead of MAPS when it came to a social media presence, where CIS were lacing up their boots and getting ready for a hike. Mab, MAPS hadn't quite decided on whether we were going to be mountain climbers or more just leisurely walkers. But then came COVID. Our plans to launch and trial various executions of social media strategy and rollout for MABS were quickly turned upside down. And we decided overnight to purchase the hiking boots and join CIS on their mountain trek. As soon as the pandemic hit, we could see that there was a hunger for information as referenced by Darren Sabrina earlier, and answers to personal for, for answers for, to personal money related questions. The natural place to go for this was online. And the risk if we weren't there is that others also knew it. And in the online space, they could push their own agenda and possibly misinformation. In other words, if we weren't there and active online, then someone else would be, and we had a responsibility to step out. Now we're moving from Citizens Information Board to Angarda Siachana and Joanna Parsons is Head of Internal Comms 
at our Irish police force and another super insight into how you can in, have meaningful engagement within a large organization. Joanna is going to talk about countering the tyranny of email. And you know, she's right to say that email gets a bad rap in the suite of digital communications that we have available to us. People see it as a nuisance or a burden or a task to wade through. But this was a challenge that Joanna wanted to take on, and she's a seasoned um, and highly experienced communications professional. And she's won four prestigious communications awards for her work within Angarda Shiokana. She's previously worked in financial services and in the charity sector. Um, and she trained as a sociologist in Trinity College, where she developed her deep interest in people and bringing that into her work within Garda Shiokana. So, Joanna, I'm really looking forward to this one and for you to convince everyone about the power of email. Thank you very much, Joanne. What an intro. Um, so, uh, my name is Joanna Parsons. I work uh, with Angara Shiakana. I'm the first ever head of internal communications um, we've had in the police service. I'm also the regional director for Ireland with the Institute of Internal Communication. I sit on their board of directors as well. Um, I wanted to go with the title of Countering the Tyranny of Email after I had a conversation with a colleague who was beyond exasperated, into infuriated with the state of his inbox and how much time it took him each day. And he called it a tyranny. It's like it's a tyranny in my life. And actually it kind of sparked other conversations with other colleagues who were also sick of wading through their inboxes. Um, weren't they brilliant? A uh, virtual round of applause uh, to our panel. Uh, first up, we had Ruth Rogers from the Southern Health Trust in Northern Ireland. And then we had Dara Woods, Sabrina Commons, Bobby Barber from Citizens Information Board. And uh, last but not least, Joanna Parsons from Angarda Shiokana. Thank you so much, guys. So much to think about. Uh, let's write shorter emails. A one-stop shop digital marketing and social media resource. Join our membership academy for 12 months. Access a library of how-to videos, template strategies, and organizational policies. Monthly live coaching. Attend webinars with subject matter experts. Meet and network with public sector pros from across the world. Use the code MEMBERSHIP20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com. And you're all very welcome back to the fourth and final session of day one from the Public Sector Digital Marketing Summit. We're coming to you live from Galway in the west of Ireland. And you will see that I have somebody who's joined me, so I'm not on my own. Marisa Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Great so to be Galway. It's, it's great to have somebody in studio. Obviously, we've had our speakers beam in from across the world all day. Um, the title of this final session is managing crisis in a pandemic and how to deal with crisis management online. And we have three remarkable public sector professionals who are going to share their insights. First of all, let me introduce you to Marisa Ryan. And Marisa is social media manager at the Health Service Executive. That's Ireland's National Health Service. And she's been working in that role for 11 years. And you are a, a seasoned comms and PR practitioner. I think you've uh, worked across press, media, digital, and, and now a social media manager. We've got lots to talk about, Marisa, lots and lots to talk about. But we're going to start, and I want you to take us back to the 1st of February 2020. Set the scene. Uh, the 1st of February 2020, I suppose it was, there was talks of COVID-19, but not quite there. I was flying back into the country. I had just been skiing. And I suppose the week before I flew out and there was little things in the airport saying about COVID-19 was there, but um, there was a different story on the way back. There was lots more posters in the place and that. Um, when I arrived back in, I had seen that my colleagues had done a live stream of a briefing during the week that mentioned it and concerns around it. And I knew that I had to get straight back into work. So on Saturday evening, we went straight into looking at content calendars and I feel like we haven't stopped since. <laughs> so we've been and working it's interesting, on it since. I, I asked you earlier, I said, is, are you still as busy? And your answer said to me, I don't know, maybe we just got used to it. But let's go from the 1st of February to the 14th of March 2020. Yeah, so at that stage, we had uh, had a couple of announcements from um, 
the Taoiseach, Leah Radcar at the time, um, given that, and we had we had been talking on social media as well as um, advertising around COVID-19, and we had our, our first case and death in Ireland at the time. Um, we had been sent home to work, and uh, I think the whole country had been working from home, possibly at that stage. And the 14th of March was a Saturday, and we use Agora Pulse. I'm sure there's lots of people here today that use that. And I did what I normally do on a Saturday morning, clicked into it to see what was happening, and could see we had a very large number of queries already in at that stage, whatever time it was. So I got up, started doing it, started working away, and a Saturday, like, I know social isn't a Monday to Friday, but we're all hired as Monday to Fridays, and obviously I would be around, but a number of my team just came online to help out that day, and that day we dealt with 990 queries through Twitter alone. Um, people were getting really concerned about it, really wondering if they had it, they felt they had symptoms and that, but this was the early stages of the pandemic, and we were only testing people who had come back from some parts of China or who possibly had met somebody with the virus um, and the following day um, things changed and you could contact your GP and your GP could arrange a test if they felt that you were you possibly needed a test so it kind of pretty much changed overnight and we had a huge following on social media that day um, a huge hits to our website and people were really dying to get information on this new virus that had arrived into the country and I suppose that was the turning point of the busyness that was to come over the next few months. Chris Shung, who is police chief at Mountain View Police Department. Um, I'm sure it's a, a sunnier day where you are, Chris. Uh, Chris is the 11th police chief of the Mountain View Police Department, located in Silicon Valley, California. For more than 26 years, he has served the Mountain View community as the department's leader. He's passionate about maintaining the MVPD's role as a progressive law enforcement organization in the 21st century. He's an internationally recognized recognized speaker and author on the topics of digital communication strategy, crisis communications management and leadership in branding. In his time with Mountain View PD, Chris has held a variety of investigative, tactical and leadership roles, serving in every division in the organization. He's a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Senior Executives in State and Local Government Program and has a master's degree in e-business management from the Notre Dame de Moore in Belmont, California. And I actually have met Chris. We we met over in California, maybe it's five or six years ago, um, and I did sign my book for him, um, my first book on, on policing and social media, but I, like all the speakers here, I watch from afar. I watch Chris's work from afar, and you know he's going to talk about when crisis strikes, how you can successfully navigate your agency's narrative in the digital age, because there are still some agencies who put fear a uh, before taking action. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's early morning with you, but please take to our virtual stage. Well, good morning from uh, sunny California and Silicon Valley to, to my uh, virtual audience. And it's probably more applic applicable to say good afternoon or good evening to, to the crowd. Um, it's an honor to be here this morning to share with you a little bit um, on our perspectives um, here in Silicon Valley, uh, in just my own backyard, we uh, the, the jurisdiction that I um, that I lead and patrol and keep safe uh, happens to have some companies that some of you might have heard of. Uh, that might be Google, which is down the street. Facebook has a couple offices here in town. Twitter is about a half hour north of us, um, and LinkedIn is down the street as well. So in this digital age, um, our agency has has, uh, in a sense, grown up with the technology um, and learned um, how to be a little bit different in the public sector. Um, and the, the topic today I really want to focus on is giving you and your agency some awareness and some maybe a different perspective and a paradigm shift on how you look at crises. Um, I like to use this quote here from Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, I think many of you are likely very familiar with him, a leader in the social media leadership space. He talks about making business decisions based on your point of view of how the world should be is the quickest way to go out of business. From California to Canada, and we are uh, going to hear from Russell Lullisher, who is a customer 
uh, who's the director, uh, digital communications director of the Ministry of Transportation in British Columbia in Canada. He's going to talk to us about a customer experience blueprint for public sector. And if you haven't heard Russell speak before, then you're in for a great treat. If you've listened to episode 17 of the Public Sector Marketing Show, then you know what to expect. Uh, Russell needs his own podcast. Maybe like Marisa, Marisa needs to write a book. Russell needs a podcast. Um, and Chris, you probably need your own YouTube channel um, because the information that you share is so rich. So Russell is an innovative leader for the British Columbia Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and Public Service-wide advisor in communications, employee engagement, social customer care, change management and customer engagement. Uh, he was named one of Canada's most influential experts on social media in the government sphere by Hootsuite in their ebook on social government. He's an advocate for great working relationships um, and also as communication and engagement leader, podcaster, speaker, continuous learner. So Russell, with all of that, uh, I'll have a rest and you can take to our virtual stage. Hello, my hands are shaking so much. I've had so much coffee this morning. We are eight hours behind you. So I'm like, my hand is literally like this. Uh, hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, welcome to the land of really long job titles, as all government seems to freaking have. Uh, my name is Russell Lawlicker. I am so excited. Chris's presentation literally could have been a tag team with what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, really, I will talk about emergency a bit, but really the problem is, is that we wait for emergencies until we actually build relationships with the public. Where the hell else are you 365 days a year? Why are you waiting till you have something to talk about before we build that trust that is absolutely essential? So before we get into, here we go, one second. Oh, before we get into um, a bit of what I'm going to talk about, we need to clarify that government, public sector talks in three different ways, political, promotional, and operational. This is how we communicate and how the public perceives us. So straight out of the gate, there's that political side of things, which I like to call the we're great and they suck kind of approach. Uh, that's if you're basically running for election or you're looking to elevate yourself. Politicians do this quite a bit, but the public confuses public sector with politics quite often. So from our perspective, it's really good to make sure we clarify. Then there's also the promotional, which is the we're awesome. Did I mention we're awesome? We're awesome. If you think you might be like this, look at your Twitter account. If you have a lot of governors and politicians in your Twitter feed, you are promotional. Uh, you're all about how awesome you are and news release, news release, news release, press conference, press conference, press conference. It's important, but it's not everything. And then last but not least, which is where a lot of us live is operational. These are the people that have around 15 years, don't really care which government's in power because they have a day-to-day -day job to do. They're literally doing customer service every day. And this, this is where I wanna talk about because this is where public trust is built. Unfortunately, it's not where the resources and the money are generally pumped into, which is the first two. Uh, they're where executive likes because they're getting the message out, they're broadcasting information. But guess what? That's not how public trust is built. I don't know what parties you've been to, but the person that always talks about themselves and how great they are, are the people that I avoid at the local party. So. What a remarkable session to end day one of the Public Sector Digital Marketing Summit. Guys, we could talk for hours about this. So, um, Russell, you've already been on the podcast. Come back on it again. Chris, you've got to come on the podcast. Marisa, you've been on it, so maybe you'll get a second run out. But I just want to say sincerely, thank you so much for taking the time so early in the morning um, and to use that uh, cliche out of your busy schedule <laughs> to be with us. But I think it's really, really important that, you sh that this community of public sector pros around the world share, connect and learn from each other because we know peer to peer learning is one of the best. And I don't even work in public sector. I'm on the outside. So I'm I'm just your tour guide. So make sure everybody who's watching live or even the replay connect with Russell, connect with Chris connect with Marisa. Joanna's going to check out our Lingus flights to California. Um, and I just want to say thank you guys and we'll talk soon. Level up your social media skills by taking our diploma in social media, plus gain an industry qualification. Use the code socialmedia20 for a 20% discount. Visit publicsectormarketingpros.com.
If this episode has whetted your appetite to learn more about digital marketing and social media for government and public sector, I'm delighted to let you know that you can now buy our replay digital ticket of the 2021 Public Sector Digital Marketing Summit. Go ahead over to publicsectormarketingpros.com forward slash 2021 summit and you can get your ticket and you can access this content in your own time and rest assured this will be content that will help you in your day job. As always, thank you so much for tuning in to the Public Sector Marketing Show. I will see you on the next episode. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Public Sector Marketing Show. This episode has ended, but your digital journey can continue. Head over to publicsectormarketingpros.com to access resources and links mentioned in today's show and to connect with Joanne and her team. Until the next time, be sure to subscribe, rate and review on your favorite podcast platform.